Letting go of every single dream I lay each one down at your feet Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I tried to win this war, I confess My hands are weary, I need your rest Mighty warrior, king of the fight No matter what I face, you're by my side mountains I need you to move when you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through when you don't give the answers as I cry out to you I will trust I will trust I will trust in you Truth is you know what tomorrow brings There's not a day ahead you have not seen And so in all things be my life and breath I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less When you don't move the mountain, I need you to move when you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my steady comfort, you are my steady hand, you are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher, your plans are always good, there's not a place where I'll go, you have already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the water, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. 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 We are gathered today together as the family of God and as we are gathered as this family of God and in this series where we are talking about the fact that we are all called to be visionary leaders because God has gifted each of us with vision that is unique to us. And so we're walking through this series and understanding um, what that means for us individually and as a congregation to call out that vision. Um, I would um, invite you to pray with me. God, we are grateful, grateful for this Sabbath time um, for many of us, not even a whole Sabbath day, perhaps just a Sabbath hour, um, just a little bit of time to um, breathe in deeply and to exhale um, all that we have carried into this space that um, needs to be set down and left with you. Um, God, we are so grateful. Um, that you name us and claim us, that you um, not only call us into this space of worship, but that you send us back out um, to be in mission um, in your world. So we know that we are your hands and your feet and that you have knit us together um, with this visionary stuff. Um, and we are um, just 
so anxious to know what it is you would have us to do um, and so eager um, to, get, to get started. Um, and so, God, we know that there are many who are crying out for you on this day. Um, we know um, that there is violence and injustice and loss and grieving um, that is overwhelming. Um, and so, as you send us out into this world, um, help us to meet those challenges, help us to meet those individuals who cry out for you, and when they cry out for you, um, we are the ones that you send. And so put us to work, um, and do you um, just, just be among this congregation as we uh, sort of move into this fall season and um, prepare ourselves um, for what you send next. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Well, we've come to um, this scripture this morning. Um, I'm really grateful that um, Erica will be sharing the message with you about this passage, um, Old Testament passage from Exodus um, this morning. It's a good word on this passage, but here it is, Exodus 18, beginning with verse 13. The next day Moses sat as judge for the people, while the people stood around him from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make known to them the statutes and instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you're doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You should represent the people before God, and you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions and make no, known to them the way they are to go and the things they are to do. You should also look for able men among all the people, men who fear God, are trustworthy, and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but decide every minor case themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, and God so commands you, then you'll be able to endure, and all these people will go to their home in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from all Israel and appointed them as heads over the people, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses, but any minor case they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went off to his own country. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our uh, current worship series, A Heart for the Work, is a five-week series, so we're currently in week three, um, which means we're just over the halfway point. In the first week, we talked about lost congregations and how sometimes we lose focus on what the main thing is and how we can bring ourselves back to it. In week two, we talked about the importance of clarity and how sometimes there's clarity gaps and what we can do to bridge them. So this week, we are ready for an epic adventure. And this week, we are going to navigate the tunnel of chaos on our way towards the clear mountains of readiness. You might say it looks a little scary, perhaps daunting. You'd be right. Although this makes me think of the camp song, Going on a Lion Hunt. And of course, when you go on a lion hunt, there's all these obstacles you encounter and there's never an easy way through, around, over, or under these obstacles. Oftentimes, you must go right through the center of them. 
So today we're going to go on a clarity hunt. And what is up ahead? My goodness, I spy a tunnel of chaos. We can't go around it. We can't go under it. We cannot go over it. We got to go through it. How many of you have seen the movie The Princess Bride? Okay, a few of you. Hopefully you'll enjoy this next bit. It's okay if you haven't. I'll try to walk you through it. In this movie, at one point, the protagonist, Wesley and Buttercup, must go through the fire swamp. The fire swamp has three main terrors or dangers. The first is fire spurts or flame spurts. Then there's the lightning sand. And finally, there's Ross, rodents of unusual size. To understand the extreme danger level of the fire swamp, Buttercup exclaims before they enter the fire swamp that they will never survive. And Wesley, of course, being ever helpful, says you're only saying that because no one ever has. Very encouraging, right? Don't worry, we're gonna make it through the tunnel of chaos. I'm not sure if they're gonna make it through the fire swamp. If you've seen the movie, don't give anything away. Nonetheless, even though no one has made it through before, they enter the fire swamp. And as we make our way through the tunnel of chaos, we'll check back in with Wesley and Buttercup to see how they fare. This is not unlike navigating the tunnel of chaos uh, when we're seeking clarity of readiness. But you may be asking yourselves, Erica, what is the tunnel of chaos? What are you talking about? I'll tell you, it essentially boils down to the stumbling blocks that we encounter as leaders that prevent us from fulfilling our vision. In order to emerge from the tunnel of chaos, we must engage with and honestly examine three main things. The first of which is we must, we must listen. We must also be humble or have humility. And third, we must be willing to recalibrate. If something is not quite right or could be better, we have to have the nimbleness to try something different. And if we're being truly honest with ourselves, recalibration takes patience. If we take a look at our scripture passage today from Exodus 18, we'll notice that we get to join Moses on his own tunnel of chaos. And he gets to do this with his father-in-law. Can we just acknowledge that's like a whole nother level of tunnel of chaos, doing it with the family tension and ties that could be present with an in-law? I'm not sure how Moses and Jethro were as in-laws, if it was different back then, but I imagine there might have been some stress having his father-in-law come and tell him what he was doing was not great and he should do it differently. That alone could be a tunnel of chaos without the added stress of what Moses was actually trying to do, which is create a justice system for all of the Israelites in a way to communicate with God. So Moses, when we encounter him, is engulfed in his own tunnel of chaos. He's blinded to the fact that the judicial system he's trying to organize is overwhelming for him and for those he's trying to serve. He's unable to see beyond the case that's directly in front of him. When Jethro, coming in for a nice visit, happens to observe him one day and sees all the stress that he is under and the unsustainable system that Moses is trying to manage. Jethro has a clarity that Moses does not, and he shares this with Moses. And it's a very pivotal point. Moses could have responded mainly two ways, the first of which I know I would be more prone to respond as, which is, like any other human, he could have balked at Jethro's advice. Imagine a time when you've poured your heart and soul into a major project or event or program. You spent hours and hours preparing and planning. You've thought through all the different things that could go right or could go wrong, hours of devotion and slaving away to keep that program or event going. And of course, you're trying to make it the best that you can with what you've got. And along comes the person you are least likely to want to hear any advice from. And what do they do? They offer their advice. That could have been Jethro. Maybe for you it's an in-law, maybe it's just a colleague who you struggle to see eye to eye with, or perhaps it's a sibling who's always trying to one-up you. You know who this person is in your life, the one who meddles and drives you up a wall. 
who makes you feel like maybe you can't do anything right, and maybe makes you feel like you didn't even consider the obvious options. But of course you did, of course you considered those options, and of course you're doing some things right. But from this person, no feedback is gonna make it through. So Moses could have been lost in the tunnel of chaos forever, and he could have heard that feedback from a person in his life like Jethro and decided it wasn't worth listening or heeding any of the feedback. That's one way he could have responded. And we also might respond in a similar situation, shunning or disregarding advice or feedback based on the source or based on our own pride. Sometimes it can be hard to hear feedback. The other way that Moses could have responded was the way that he did. He listened with an open heart. And he wasn't just pretending to listen while making a list of all the things that Jethro was saying wrong out of spite. No, no, he actually listens. In verse 24, it says so, Moses listened to his father-in-law. And while he listens, he humbles himself. He makes himself open to this idea of perhaps doing what he's doing differently. He may have thought, Moses that is, that he was doing all right with his system before Jethro showed up. That his gifts or his brute strength were enough to cover the impossible task of sorting out issues and bringing them before God for all of the Israelites. But instead, he listens to his father-in-law, and he sees the clarity that Jethro brings, and he did all that Jethro said. And because he's listened, and because he humbles himself, he also is set up then to recalibrate, to fine-tune the system that Jethro puts forth. He chooses to act upon Jethro's recommendation, looking for capable leaders among him and training them up, equipping them for the work ahead making changes as needed as those and those he selects adapt to this new system. That's the calibration process. Taking a step and adjusting, taking another step and assessing, being nimble enough to change when necessary to optimize the vision, the system. This calibration and recalibration, this is what frees Moses through the delegation of tasks to other capable leaders throughout the Israelite community, Moses is liberated to lead in other ways and in a healthier capacity. It took Jethro voicing his vision to Moses and Moses listening for the clarity of readiness to be upon him, to make the change, and to make the change toward a vision of sustainability. It lightens the load while equipping other leaders and continuing the work of justice that he began while still centered and focused on God, but no longer unstable and unsustainable. While we at Marquette Hope are not looking to build an entire justice system for Marquette Hope or for the greater communities in which we are, we are, however, seeking a clarity of readiness for our vision as Marquette Hope within the greater communities we are a part of. We are seeking to hone in on our vision in such a manner that We've examined the ways in which the tunnel of chaos barriers are interfering with our clarity of vision and how we can overcome them. So we're back to the beginning of the tunnel of chaos where we have to ask ourselves, are we listening? What are the ways in which we have or haven't been or aren't listening to those around us? Maybe those who can see a bigger picture than we can, like perhaps God. We can start there. God certainly has a vision for us, and sometimes patience and listening are exactly what we need to make it clear. Or perhaps it's listening to other people, either within our congregation or our greater communities, that have a different viewpoint, like Jethro did when he visited Moses. Coming in from the outside, he could see things better than Moses could on the inside. As we seek to work with United Way, and see the needs of the community around us, they're helping us see a bigger vision and clarifying with us. And then, of course, not only are we listening, but is our pride interfering? Are we truly open to listening to what they have to say? In what ways should we be looking at what we're doing that perhaps maybe we're not the best at, or that someone else among us is better? As a person in leadership, it can be hard. There's a pressure sometimes to know it all 
or, or be it all or do all the things. But as we're reminded in Church Unique, the book that's helping guide us through this series, Will Mancini, the author, reminds us that clarity of readiness sometimes requires us to die to the fact that we do not possess the giftedness we try to project. Now all that sentence is really saying, it took me reading it a couple times, is to realize it's dress, addressing the core of humility. Sometimes we like to say that we're really good at something, or we've been told we're an expert at something, and that's simply because we've been put in that leadership role thinking we might be. But in truth, sometimes we have to say, hey, I'm not as good at this as I thought I was, and that's okay. When we look at what Moses was doing, I'm certain there were people around him telling him, you're doing a wonderful job, this justice system you have where we all come to you. And yet, it needed to be expanded, it needed to be delegated so that Moses could share his gifts of leadership with others around him who also had leadership. So sometimes it's not necessarily about stepping down. Moses stepped down, but it was about all the leaders who stepped up to fill and to delegate. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, can we set aside our pride or our preconceived notions of what we're good at or gifted with and examine what we are or aren't? Some of us struggle with having too much on our plates and some of us struggle with seeing where our giftedness fits in or can be helpful. Moses and Jethro, Jethro's approach was to have Moses step away from doing everything while simultaneously inviting and equipping capable leaders to step up. And I can tell you, if one thing is certain about our vision for having a heart for the work, it is that it is going to take more leaders, not less, for our vision to become clear and our vision to become real. In what ways should we be looking at recalibrating or optimizing our process or approach? In what ways have we assumed we knew the correct way or were doing it the best way? And perhaps that's because we've always done it that way, right? Maybe it hasn't been examined critically. I can tell you one thing. I studied my undergrad in mechanical engineering and we had to take a course, a year-long course called senior design. We were on the quarter system and the first quarter, all that we did was take a look at the problem presented to us figure out all the issues that led up to that problem, and then think of a boatload of solutions. What are all the different ways that this problem could potentially be solved? I'm talking 11 weeks of going through what is the problem and what are some solutions. It was a lot. And then the second quarter, we had to pick one of those solutions. Now that we've come up with hundreds, we've got to pick the one that we think is the best and take it through its paces to see if it would work third quarter was all about recalibrating and optimizing. With that solution, the one that we finally would land on, what do we need to tweak? What do we need to do to make the design simpler, easier to use or install, or less expensive to manufacture and produce? And if you thought that as a team we moved through that seamlessly, well, you'd be wrong. It took a lot of listening to one another and our professors and leaders. It took a lot of humility of setting our pride aside and our, the, the solution we thought was the best because we thought of it. it probably wasn't the best solution just because we thought of it. And a lot of recalibrating to optimize that solution to the problem at hand. And through it all, we were able to achieve a clear vision. It's a similar process for us sometimes. Even though our scripture passage makes it sound like Jethro gave the advice, Moses listened to the advice, and wham, they had a perfectly functioning new justice system the next day. Probably not how it worked, right? There was probably quite a bit of recalibrating. We got like the summary after it all happened. We got the summary version. Um, they didn't go into the details about Moses training up those new leaders or equipping them or saying, hey, this is how we're going to try it. And then a week later, nope, we got to do something a little bit different, right? But all of that, I can guarantee you that happens. There was some time that it took to really get them in the fine-tuned, calibrated process that needed to be there. It was similar for my senior design team. We finished the semester or the year and we had this beautiful poster that we hung up in the hallway and said, look, look at what we've done. It's so beautiful. And it didn't show any of the struggle. It didn't show any of the tunnel of chaos that we had to go through. Instead, it just showed our results. But I tell you, it was a full year of struggling through it. Our biblical commentator, Walter Brueggemann, in his reflection on this Exodus passage says, serious justice requires imag imaginative, unending interpretation. 
And I would like to suggest that we switch justice for vision because it holds true as well. Serious vision requires imaginative, unending interpretation. As we emerge from the tunnel of chaos, we begin to listen, to humble ourselves, to recalibrate our ideas and vision, and then we can begin to see the clear mountains of readiness. The tunnel of chaos can certainly be daunting. It asks a lot of us to re-examine who we are or aren't listening to, to humble ourselves and separate our pride from the process, to recalibrate the vision and the patience to go through multiple revisions of the vision. If we jump back to the Princess Bride and the daunting fire swamp that Wesley and Buttercup were about to enter, it had its fire spurts, lightning sand, and ro uh, uh, rodents of unusual size, which all had imposed an impossible barrier to all who had attempted it before. But as they entered the fire swamp, they discovered some things. And they discovered that if they listened, the fire spurts gave off a pop before they fired up so they could avoid them if they listened. And then they recognized what the lightning sand was, mostly because they walked into it and then had to free themselves from it. But once they knew what the lightning sand looked like, they could avoid it by walking around it. And the third main threat was those rodents of unusual size. And this, I'm not sure if you can see it very well. I wanted to do a, uh, a gif, a gif, I don't know how you say those things. It was really funny at the time, but we just have this meme. So essentially, Buttercup confronts Wesley and is like, but what about the rodents of unusual size? We haven't seen them yet. We've seen the first two, but what about the rodents? And he's like, I don't think they exist. And then, half a second later, he gets tackled by a giant rodent. So um, that would be the humility, right? <laughs> like, oh, it's fine. Everything's going to be fine. And then you get blindsided by something. Um, but ignoring the presence of the, the rodents did not work. Anywho, moving on. Back to Moses and Jethro. If they can create an entirely new justice system and Wesley and Buttercup can survive the fire swamp, which they did, there, I haven't given away the whole movie, but they do make it through the fire swamp, then we as Marquette Hope can certainly rise up as leaders who listen, who are willing and humble, and who have a nimbleness to adjust and recalibrate as needed on the fly with patience. As Jethro once said to Moses, I'll now say to you, look among you, for people who are capable. They will share your load. If you do this and God directs you, then you will be able to endure. May it be so. We hope you're enjoying Pod Church. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and be notified each time there's a new video. To learn more about everything that's happening in and around Marquette Hope, check out our Facebook page. You can also get our newsletter on the Facebook as well. Church is the weekly online worship of Marquette Hope, a United Methodist faith community located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Find us at facebook.com slash mqthope, mqthope.com, and on YouTube.